Thank you, Beverly and Brenda and Andrea, for leading us in worship today. We are blessed. Amen. If you want to get your Bibles, please, and open them to Matthew chapter 10. Now, the lectionary reading for this fourth Sunday uh, of Pentecost uh, is, is Matthew 10, 24 through 39. And I, I'm just going to use 37 through 39. I'm going to pull in another text later on in the, in the sermon that I want you to hear as well. But these are the words that God kind of struck me with when I read this text. Anyone who loves their father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. Anyone who loves their son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. Whoever does not take up their cross and follow me is not worthy of me. Whoever finds their life will lose it. And whoever loses their life for my sake will find it. And now, O oh God, give me power to speak the truth in love. And give us all ears to hear. Amen. This is a very disturbing text to me because it clearly puts our relationship with Jesus ahead and above every other relationship in life, including our parents and our children. And that's hard. That's just humanly hard. We don't want to put anything between us and our commitment to our children and parents. But this is consistent with other teachings of Jesus. In Matthew 22, Jesus was asked, what is the greatest commandment? And he replied in verse 37, love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and greatest commandment. And then he added, the second's like it, love your neighbor as yourself. But in other words, he, he's saying here that you, you've got to love God above any other thing, period, paragraph. Now, for us to comp fully comprehend the point that's being made here, we have to do just a little bit of word study. Now, you've heard this from me, but I feel like I must repeat it because I want to make sure that we all are on the same page and get the same point of, of this sermon. Uh, in the English language, we have only one word for this emotion that wells up in us uh, that we call love. It's just one word. And that creates something of a problem or some confusion because we say that we love our parents and that we love our children and that we love our spouses, right? Right? But we also say that we love our dogs, that we love fried chicken and banana pudding. <laughs> now, surely, we don't mean the same thing uh, by the word love in all of those contexts. Now, the language of the New Testament is ancient Greek, and it sought to avoid some of this confusion. There are several uh, Greek words for love. I'll just mention a few of them that we're familiar with. And they're to be used in according to, to the context. The first one is phileo, and that expresses the love of children. That's why Philadelphia is the city of brotherly love. It comes from the Greek word phileo. Then there's storge, which is the love of family, the natural affection we have for members of our family, are supposed to have for the members of our family. Uh, and then there's eros, which where we get the word erotic, it's for romantic love. And then there's this fourth word that's used a lot in the Bible, agape, which is to describe the love of God. And uh, the ancient meaning of this word agape is to seek after or to prefer, to seek after or prefer. But the New Testament writers of the Bible 
somewhat expanded its meaning as Paul does so eloquently in 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I think sometimes we just ought to go read that maybe about once a week to remind us what love really is when we're talking about the love of God. But let me just give you some points that are emphasized about this love of God, about this agape love. Number one, agape love is unconditional and it's unselfish. Now you think about those two things ought to scare us. It's absolutely unconditional. You just love. Period. Paragraph. End of story. And it's unselfish. You're not seeking anything out of it. Uh, the second one is it gives and keeps on giving. It never stops. It just, it just keeps on giving. Number three, it seeks the highest and best for the beloved, for the person loved. Number four, it seeks nothing in return. Nothing, in, it doesn't ask for anything back. And the fifth thing is this, it is never deserved, it's not deserved, but it's freely given. You cannot do anything to deserve God's love, but he gives it to us freely. This love, this agape love, is not a passive emotion, but it's a decision. It's an exercise of one's will. It's an active choosing. It is the love of God. Now, this is what humans long for because we were created for it. Humans long for it, but fallen humanity has demonstrated over and over and over again that it is incapable of agape love. We just don't have it in us. And all of us know you can't give what you don't have, can you? I mean, I'd love for everybody, I'd love to give you all a million dollars each when you left the church today. But I can't do that, can I? <laughs> I don't get paid quite that much. We talk about love, we write songs and poems about love, and we tell people we love them, but we can only give what we have. And just about all we have is Philio, Storge, and Eros. But people need and want agape. It's quite a dilemma, isn't it? Well, there is an answer. A biblical answer. It's in Romans 5, verse 5. Paul says, And hope does not disappoint us because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts by the Holy Spirit who was given to us. So, if we are Christians, we now have this agape love, this love of God living in us that we can now give away. But to give it is still an act of our will. God doesn't make us do anything. If we want God to move in our lives, we've got to cooperate with Him. We've got to want Him to come. We've got to want to live in obedience to God. We have to decide to love others unconditionally Amen. the way Jesus loved us by dying for us on the cross while we were still sinners. We didn't get our acts together. He died for us before we would ever acknowledge him as Lord. Jesus put it like this in Luke 9, 23. If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself. Take up his cross daily and follow me. Now think about what that means. You couldn't take up your cross daily if it, if it meant to be literal. Because when you pick up your cross, you knew one thing for sure. In about three or four hours, you're going to be dead. So you couldn't do that daily. He's talking about we've got to learn to live sacrificially and as he sacrificed his life on Calvary so that we could come into a relationship with God, then we must daily die to ourself so we can live unto Jesus and represent him in this world by loving 
others. Amen. Now, as I mentioned, this is a two-text sermon. We well, said, preacher, you've already read about three <laughs> or four, but those weren't texts. That was just supported verses. <laughs> Here's a text, and this is the longer of the two texts I was going to read because there's some important words in here. That first text just raised a lot of questions in my mind. How am I going to do that? How am I going to love God more than I love my family? And then you read chapter 4, 1 John chapter 4, beginning at verse 7. He says these words. Dear friends, let us love one another, for love comes from God. Everyone who loves has been born of God and knows God. Whoever does not love does not know God because God is love. This is how God showed his love among us. He sent his one and only son in the world that we might live through him. This is love. Not that we love God, but what? And he showed his love by sending his only son into the world. He loved us and sent his son as the atoning sacrifice for all the sins. Dear friends, since God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one's ever seen God, but if we love one another, God lives in us and his love is made complete in us. This is how we know that we live in him and he in us. He has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testify that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. If anyone acknowledges that Jesus is the Son of God, God lives in them and they in God. And so we know and rely on the love God has for us. God is love. God doesn't just love, he is love. He can't help but love, he is love. Whoever lives in love lives in God and God in them. And this is how love is made complete among us so that we will have confidence on the day of judgment. In this world we are like Jesus. There is no fear in love, but perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates a brother or sister is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother or sister whom they have seen cannot love God whom they've not seen. And he has given us this command. Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. Now look, the term for brother and sister, they're not, returning, not referring to blood kin referring to brothers and sisters in, in the faith, really. But that's also extended to others because in other places in the New Testament, we're commanded not only to love those in the church, but we're to love our enemies. Amen. God is love, and if he lives in us, his love is going to be seen in us. All right, well, that's the second sermon. Now, when John wrote this text, 1 John, he, he was an older man, maybe a real old man. And, uh, and if there's one thing we could say about John, at this stage in his life, he is obsessed with love. Now again, the Greek word we translate love in this text is what? Phileo? Eros? Storge? Nope. It's agape. He uses it 26 times in this one passage. He's obsessed with it. And he's not alone. The word agape in its various forms appears 320 times in the New Testament. John understands, you see, that real love, agape, now not the lust or the uh, sentim mushy sentimentalism that we call love in this world. He's not talking about that, but agape, a real love, is the most important and the most powerful force in the universe. That's why God chose love as the way to win the world to him. It's powerful. 
In fact, John goes so far to say that God is love. He doesn't love. He is love. Now, if we love God, if we truly love God, it will show in that we love others. Amen. Now, again, others is a very broad inclusive term yes it means family it means neighbors but it also means the poor and disenfranchised in our culture it means those who are not like us uh, why it even includes our enemies we are told explicitly in the new testament on more than one occasion to love our enemies verse 19 sums it up we can love because he first loved us. He poured his love into our lives by the Holy Spirit, so now we have love to give. We have the capacity to love with agape. Now that's why our relationship with God has got to be the primary focus of our lives. It's where we get the agape love that we are to extend to others. You know, there's one thing that I, I told my daughter, my older daughter, Mari, when uh, she was talk, they were talking about getting married. And I said, I just want you to understand one thing. He, can, he cannot love you any more than he loves Jesus. <laughs> He cannot love you any more than he loves Jesus because he won't be capable of it. It's Jesus, our love for Jesus, that relationship that builds in us the agape love that we can give to others, the sacrificial, unconditional love. Now, quickly, there are four love principles here uh, that I think we should note remember. And I'm not saying that that's all the love principles that are in this text, but these are the four that I picked. The first is this, receiving God's love is a profound experience. It's not just, well, yeah, I went to church today and I just went in there and received God's love and everything's going to be good now. No, it's totally life-changing. Totally life-changing. For 13 years, I practiced law in the city of Athens. And I had a successful law practice with a great firm with people I loved and cared about. And now I'm a preacher. That didn't happen because I made a decision. Nobody would make the decision to do that. You understand what I'm saying? God's love changed my life. Amen. Where I began to think differently uh, because of it. And I'm not saying everybody gets saved got to be a preacher. I'm, that's not it. That's not it. We're called individually to what God wants us to do. But I'm just saying that it's totally life-changing. We are transformed into people that we haven't been before. Amen. You know, in his younger days, John, who wrote this text, he and his brother James, remember they came, they were disciples of Jesus. And do you remember what they were called? Sons of Thunder. And they weren't called that because they were sweet little boys at the synagogue picnic. No, they were wild bucks. Something happened to John. He encountered and he received the love of God and it radically transformed his life. He is now obsessed. There's a, you can be obsessed by one thing without it being negative, and that is the love of God. You can be obsessed with that. He is controlled by God's love. But you know, but for God's love to have that effect in our lives, it has to be received. You understand what I mean? We've got to take it in. I've known people who you all no, I could I couldn't shouldn't say that. I have known people, but I have been people <laughs> who knew about God. That God so loved the world, He sent Jesus to die for the sins of the world. 
but we're still not able to receive God's love. Well, why, why is that? Well, I think there are obstacles in this world uh, to receiving God's love. I'm going to mention three that are common, and they were true with me. Number one uh, is a false image of God. We don't understand who God is and what he's like. Um, a lot of us have image of God being the judge. He's up there with a big hammer and going to whack us every time we do something bad. Our image is sometimes distorted because we attribute the failures of our earthly fathers to our heavenly father. And some people, you can, don't talk to them about God being their heavenly father. They don't want to talk about a father because they had horrible fathers. See, we have to learn about God's love the way a father should truly love his children. And then we may even have to forgive our earthly fathers. I know my kids, <laughs> and I, man, I'm a preacher. They still got a lot to forgive me of. We're human. We fail. We don't get it all right. Sometimes we just have to forgive that past and say, okay, Father, I, I want you to love me like I was supposed to be loved. B, second thing is, is a poor self-image. This is often the case with those who were abused as children. They somehow get the idea that the abuse was something that they deserved. That they, and, and the same is true with many who were serious sinners, like myself. They don't feel they deserve God's love. So it's very hard for them to receive it, you see. We have to learn that God loved us perfectly. You know what I first wrote down in, in my notes is that God loved us perfectly the day we were born. But that's not true. God loved us perfectly when we were conceived. But that's not even the truth. He loved us perfectly since the beginning of time because he knew we were coming. Amen. And he has loved us perfectly. And I heard a preacher say this one time, and it drastically changed my life. He said, let me, let me make this clear to you. There is absolutely nothing, absolutely nothing you have done or can do to make God love you any less than he's loved you since the beginning of time. And there's nothing you can make him to do to make him love you anymore. Amen. You can't do anything to deserve God's love. He perfectly loves you now, wherever you are, whatever you've done, whatever you're about. He loves you and wants nothing but the best for you. The third one is pride. <clears throat> now, we think of ourselves as good people, don't we? I mean, there are those over there that aren't so good. But we're good people. And when good people, we often fail to see our desperate need for God. Now, I've done this with you before. I ask you to raise your hands. How many of you have ever told a lie? And how many of you ever stole anything? And all of you raised your hands. And we're all liars and thieves. Everybody's sitting in this room. I guarantee you, you've stolen about a nickel out of your mama's purse or something. Picked up a nickel off the kitchen floor, you knew it wasn't yours. <laughs> and we've all lied. Lord, have mercy. Liars and thieves are some of the worst people in Oklahoma County sitting right here in church. You need God. Trust me. Amen. You need God. Amen. We've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God, and we're desperately in need of God. Now, the second love principle. A love relationship with God increases our love for others. Now listen again. We love because he first loved us. Whoever claims to love God yet hates his brother or sister is a liar. Now the title of this sermon is Loving God Dash Loving Others. It's two sides to the same coin. You can't have one without the other. 
If you really love God, you will love others. And if you don't love others, it means you're, you've not been made complete in God's love. You're not extending your love and receiving his love. Because when you receive his love, you will be motivated to love others. All right, the third love principle is this. God's love eliminates fear. God's love eliminates fear. In 1 John 4.18, you heard me read just a minute ago. He says, but perfect love drives out fear. Fear. There's no fear in love. Perfect love drives out fear because fear has to do with punishment. The one who fears is not made perfect in love. You know, I think that most people cannot really love others uh, because of fear. There's the fear of rejection. There's the fear of failure. There's the fear that we will be hurt disappointed or made a fool of. John tells us when we truly receive God's love, it is the end of fear. And his reasoning is that fear is rooted in the fear of judgment, punishment in the eternal sense. But when we receive God's love, we no longer fear God's punishment. You know, we know, he might spank us on occasion. <laughs> I mean, I've had to go to the woodshed a couple of times with God. Uh, but, he's not, but we're not going to have judgment for sin. Our sins are under the blood. See? So we're not going to have punishment for, for sin. Now, we might have some corrective measures taken throughout our lives when we fail to follow God. So when we receive God's love, we no longer fear punishment. And all the promises of God become personal to us. Now, if I know and believe that the God who loves me is omnipotent, all-powerful, omniscient, all-knowing, omnipresent everywhere all the time, and that He desires good for me, and that He will be with me forever... What is there to be afraid of? What? As Paul says in Romans 8, 31, if God's for us, who can be against us? In that same chapter, Paul says that in all the irrelevancies, problems, and pain of living in a fallen world, we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. Why are we still afraid? <laughs> Jesus must have asked the disciples that a dozen times. Why are you afraid? John said it can only be because we've not been made perfect in God's love. Love principle number four is we can love because he first loved us. We cannot give what we don't have. Amen. You know, I, I, I was always taken when I first started preaching uh, about the vows of Christian marriage. When we stand there and tell this other person, husband or wife, about to be, that we're going to love them for better, for worse, for richer, for poorer, in sickness and in health until death do us part. I said, can anybody in their right mind honestly and sincerely say that and believe they're up to it? Apart from God, I don't know how you could. Because Christian marriage assumes the love of God, agape. Amen. No one's ever made that it's incapable of keeping that vow on their own, in their own strength and power. We're just not capable of that kind of love. But the good news of today's sermon is that the incredible claim of Jesus Christ is this. He says, I can re reproduce my life in anyone who will give their life to me for that purpose. Is that incredible? Amen. Amen. Jesus, who is the perfect 
image of God whose name is love will give us the power to love as God loves. Not only for our spouse, but also for our family. How many of y'all have hard to love people in your family even? But our family, for our friends, our neighbors, and our, let me hear it, enemies. That's right. We can love because he first loved us and gives us his love through the indwelling Holy Spirit. Love God. Love others. It is the way we were made to live. Pray with me. God, have mercy on us and help us to live by your word each and every day and to love with our whole heart just as Jesus loved us. And now if you would uh, get your communion.